Ladies and gentlemen, we have a very special guest today, Anders Bowling. He is a Swedish journalist and independent researcher and uh, has an amazing YouTube channel that I was brought brought my attention to. He, you've done some amazing interviews with some of the most esoteric scientists that we uh, on our channel love, people like Robert Schock and um, who's the guy who does the elongated skulls? Brian Forrester. Yeah, he's a, a good friend of my friend who does some interviews with him uh, living down in Peru. And more importantly is the Robert Shock interview. Very hard man to get a hold of or an interview with. How did you do it? I don't know. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me, uh, by the way. It's, it's wonderful to be here. And uh, as, as flattering that you call me an independent researcher, I wouldn't go as far as that. But I am an independent journalist, uh, used to be a news journalist, but I'm recovering from that now. <laughs> so, uh, well, how did I get ho a hold of Robert? I think I, I, I emailed him a couple of times. I mean, he didn't, he didn't uh, do it the first time. He didn't want to do it the first time, but he wasn't, uh, I mean, yeah, I can't really remember, but I think he just answered something like, oh, it's too much now and uh, maybe come back later in six That's months. That's what I get. I get like a few months, I'm doing a thing. Can we call me in a month, a few months. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know so, if it was some, something I wrote, some formulation. I, I can't really remember, but he, he kind of, for some reason, he liked what I asked, asked him. About. Well, you, you claim you're not a researcher, but here is the reason I, I had you on the show. Because people like you and I, if we keep doing the same thing for a long period of time, like in, in my case, it, it's more of a red pill thing. About 20 years ago, I started looking into our food supply. And then I, I, got, I went into a rabbit hole with Monsanto. And I found out that Monsanto is the most deadly multinational corporation on earth. They've killed millions of people over the last 120 years. And all they do is they pay lawsuits and they keep move, pushing forward, murdering people and polluting the food supply now. They've, in fact, in the last few decades, have controlled the seed supply on earth and when it gets controversial, they just change their name. So now they are bear. They're back to bear. Back in World War II, they were bear too, and they were creating chemicals to, to literally kill people during the Holocaust. And now the, this company is controlling the food supply. So when I got put those pieces together, my head exploded. And I said, there is something nefarious going on with this world, and I need to look deeper. And in the last 20 years of my deep dive, my mind has been blown. Almost everything that we know on the planet is a complete lie. We live in a fantasy world controlled by media narratives. And you are one of the guys puppeting those lies. And at some point you must've said, wait a minute, I have a conscience. I've got to do something different. Yeah. Well, it's a little bit like that, but I mean, I'm a very, uh, I think I'm, I'm more into, you know, loving humankind and all that. So I'm not very, I'm not very fond of, you know, being angry and being, uh, well, I guess, I mean, people, people accuse people like us of being um, conspiracy theorists. And I, I don't like that, that they, they accuse us of that because I know that you can, you can call anyone a conspiracy theorist whose ideas you don't like, whose opinions you don't like. So I don't like that. But on the other hand, I'm also not a full-blown conspiracy theorist, if you will, because yeah. I think there are actually golden threads of truth in in most things that are reported i mean i've been in mainstream media for for 25 years uh, for crying out loud i mean uh, so i i've seen i've seen what's happening there and i i know so many people in there and they're they're brilliant people good people nice people they want to do good things they want to i mean most of them if not all think that they are actually doing the right thing and well they so, are doing the right thing for the company yeah, I know. I know. You have to. You have to get out of the box for a while to see, or 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 get up a, a bit a bit to see what's actually happening, and ask yourself questions. Maybe you have. You need to have a particular kind of conscience. I don't know. I uh, I've always felt a little bit, I think, different than than others. But I've also been very good at playing the mainstream game. So I'm. I think many many people were pretty surprised when I, <laughs> when I just quit my job and started doing these things. And, uh, but, but I have felt for a long time, I, I'd say the last 10 years when I was a journalist, that, which I was mainly at the big, biggest newspaper, morning newspaper in Sweden, uh, I, I wanted to quit because I felt that I wanted to be independent. And I, I mean, not everybody has that urge, but, 
but I've always had that urge. What was it that was gnawing at you to make you finally well, say it's enough? I, I can I can say one practical thing that made me f- f- uh, make the decision was was that I got some money. Uh, Mm. As we were talking about before this interview, I, I got I got an inheritance, and me and my ex-wife we sold the house, so we got some money for that. So there, there was a pile of money, so I, it was a perfect, perfect uh, time to to quit my job, which was in 2020. But the thing that made me feel that I needed to to get out of that <laughs> matrix or that box was, I mean, it was several things, but m- m- basically a sense that. You can't really write and talk and about uh, everything here. It's it's not really possible. And and I don't think that's just the media. I don't think it's just me. It's it's within the justice system. It's within science. It's within politics. My God, of course, it's within politics. And so there are many areas where there are some unwritten rules. You know. Yeah. So are you refer? Are you alluding to the censorship machine? that has been going on for a couple of years. Like if you mentioned vaccine two years ago, you got deplatformed. If yeah. you mentioned this, you get removed. If you yeah. say, oh, maybe it's not global warming. You're like, ah, they shadow ban you and no one ever sees your video. I've experienced it uh, firsthand. I mean, on my podcast, I had, I had this episode that was, that was uh, deplatformed or banned by, by YouTube twice, actually. <laughs> but for some reason, it it came back on. I don't know why. I have no explanation. Got no explanation. I, I interviewed this doctor in Sweden who was very critical towards, you know, the vaccine mandates and things like that. And on, at at this newspaper I was working in, uh, working for, I experienced that I was um, being taken as taken uh, taken aside and uh, informed that what I had been writing about climate change was perhaps not the best thing to do. I mean, they were all very. Very kind, very nice, and all that. But it was one of the highest bosses, and he, he told me that, you know, we normally have have this policy around these things, uh, like we have <laughs> towards also uh, those who deny Holocaust, you know. And I was just, it just made me <laughs> cold when, when he said that. How can he <laughs> even refer to that? Well, when uh, listen, and I mean, I've, I've I've talked to him afterwards, and he has he, he has no recollection of having said that. Of course, but he said he's a very nice guy, and he said if I said that, I have to, I have to, I mean, I have to stand up to what I've said, told you. So, so I take responsibility for that. And I'm sorry that that I said that, but I can't remember. He did that anyway, and uh, so there was, and I was, I was writing the most quote unquote controversial stuff about climate change that I was writing was in a blog that I had. It was called the uh, the Progress Blog blog. And uh, it was a great thing to have because I, I could write more freely in there. And I wrote freely about all kinds of things that I thought were more progressive and more positive than, than, than people in general think. And especially than you would think if you only read <laughs> the, news, the, the news sections. But when it came to climate change, I wanted to give a different story, a story that told people who are very, very scared, especially young people, that mm. it isn't as bad as you think. I mean, I, and I, I, I know a lot about this topic. I have been a climate nerd since, I mean, weather nerd since I was a kid and I would been following the, the climate discussion and climate science since maybe 25 years ago at least. And so I know, I know what I'm talking about. And I read peer reviewed papers. I, at least I read, read the abstract, but sometimes I read the whole thing and I read a lot of papers and I talk to a lot of scientists. And I know that for instance, one of my pet uh, subtopics in this topic is um, Weather extremes, and I know I've I've known for a long time that they don't increase. They don't increase. That's a fact. I mean, there are a few minor ones, but basically they don't increase. And that's I mean, it's terrible for all the alarmists because they don't want to hear that. No, and they believe it. That's the problem. I know. I know. They believe hurricanes are getting stronger. They believe that this is getting bigger. They believe this, that, and the other. When if you go look, like Ryan Maui is the top scientist in the field when it comes to hurricane intensity and strength. And he has proven over the last decade with dozens of graphs that no mainstream media outlet ever puts up that hurricane intensity is decreasing. Hurricane frequency is decreasing. Mm. And and the media says the exact opposite and these alarmists gobble it up. It's almost like a disease where people have been so brainwashed into believing in climate change. If you say anything other than what they believe in, it hurts them internally, like their soul. They're like, oh, you just hurt me. And I don't get it. And, and earlier, 
uh, you said that you were uh, a conspiracy theorist, but you're a low level conspiracy theorist, Anders. No, you I don't know. I said, I'm, I said I'm, I'm not very fond of. of yeah, the and all of the, I'm pretty sure all of your conspiracy theories have come true because any low level conspiracy theorist is only reporting on the actual science that is opposite of the media narrative. That is the definition of a conspiracy theorist. Yeah. If you say the opposite of the propaganda machine, then you're a conspiracy theorist. The yeah. propaganda machine says that the Hunter Biden laptop is Russian uh, disinformation when everyone knows it's Hunter Biden's laptop. Mm -hmm. I mean, we live in a literal fairy tale that is being constructed by the mainstream media. And it's funded by much higher multinational corporations that own them. So, so there is a cabal. And if you say well, the word cabal, yeah, you, you, you are it, yeah, a conspiracy you, you, theorist. Yeah, you know, you know, just as well as I do. If, if you use those words, you're you're being yeah. banned from every mainstream. Everything, mainstream everywhere. They, I mean, you're yeah blacklisted. So I I prefer not to use those words. Now I I don't think I, I'm not even sure there is a what you call a cabal. I mean, there is a structure. There is a. I often use the word matrix. I think it's a it's a brilliant word to use because it's also it, within that that concept of a matrix. You can see that that there there is not necessarily anyone who knows what is actually going on. There there might not even be. I mean, people who know exactly what they're doing because it's just kind of a it's a matrix that that self perpetuates. It it works as a yeah. as a system of its own, and it includes, as you say, the media, but also politics the justice system the educational system science they're all it's all in the same you know loop it, they're all playing the same dancing the same dance well the again. definition of cabal the definition of cabal is a um a fringe political clique mm -hmm. and that's what we have we have a globalist clique of very wealthy people, whether it could be BlackRock that controls all the assets or large multinational corporations, whether they're all getting in, having a meeting or doing a Zoom call together is irrelevant. What each individual entity is working for the same goal, which is total control of humanity, where they control all the resources, all the assets. And we've heard Klaus Schwab and uh, the Great Reset, you will own nothing and you will love it. You will eat the bugs or whatever the, the narrative coming out from there is. These top players in the clique, let's not call it a cabal, it's a political clique of globalists, which eat means cabal by definition. These people are, are, are calling, you know, they're calling the shots, they're calling the punches or whatever you want to call it. Once you have that much control, then we have a problem. Mm. Yeah, well, I, I I hear what you say, and I I mean, I, I think those thoughts sometimes when I hear people like Klaus Schwab and others uh, speaking, and also Anthony Fauci and, and, and all those others. Uh, Fauci, but, Fauci. I mean, yeah, I'm not I'm not sure. I I, I don't really want to. I'm not much into hatred, you know. <laughs> I'm more I into love. So you're into like the summer of love. You're you're you you're a leftist hippie, which is where I come from. But I, in the last 20 years, I've rapidly moved to the right. I well, passed I center I ground. Left, I don't believe in left and right anymore. I'm, yeah. I, I think yeah, because what happened was I, I escaped the left to go to the right, and then I came right back to the middle because yeah. my ideology has parts of this side and parts of that side. Yeah. And to claim that I'm on one side is completely nonsensical because I, to be yeah. if, you, if you want to talk politics, middle is the only place to be if you're wise. And, and you want to Especially talk. now, because what's happened is we have this uh, dichotomy that used to be tight and now it is spread so wide that if you believe in something over here, then the people way over here immediately hate you, but they don't understand that you also support the majority of things that they support. Like, yeah like not going to war and uh, not having people starve to death in the streets while we give billions of dollars to a proxy war. There are, and, and the majority of the population doesn't want us to be in a war that has nothing to do with our country. What are, are you living in Sweden? Yeah. You speak perfect English, which is amazing yeah, right. because most <laughs> foreign people have accents that are uh, unintelligible for the most part. I lose, I lose the words sometimes, but I think my accent is okay. Yeah. So what is the general, let's like say, what is the environment in Sweden when it comes to this proxy war that's going on, Russia and Ukraine? Do the people support Ukraine? Like 
like America claims that we're all, hey, we all love Ukraine. That's not true. Over half of the population of the US thinks that Russia is in the right. It's not mm -hmm. on the mainstream media. And I'm sure in Sweden, you don't, you don't know that. What is your, what are you getting over there as far as from our media? Uh, well, the propaganda is what I'm I asking. Have, I, have a, I have a hard time actually saying anything else other than this being a very unjust i mean every war is unjust and it's uh i, I can't really understand how a country like russia can be so scared of their uh, the country surrounding them but i also know about the the whole nato history what nato has said and not said the U u.s politicians have have said all through the 90s and the early 20, 2000s. I know, I know that. I know what's happening, what has happened. This is like fourth grade history, history, right? This actually did a great interview with um, Russell Brand on this, actually, which was very interesting. Ooh. But I mean, it's still, it's not, you can't, you can't justify attacking a country like that. It's, it's not justifiable. And, and I think people in, in this country, as you say, in Europe, in general, in Western Europe, I have, it's very, very difficult. To, I, I, have, I have a hard time thinking that, more than a tiny minority would support the Russians in this case, and I mean personally, I don't, I don't want to support any country. I, I, I would, I was very reluctant to, I mean, put up Ukrainian flags on my, you know, social media accounts like many people did when this war started because I, I felt in my, in my gut that I mean, it's not as simple as that. It's not mm -hmm. as simple as that. There's, there, there's no good guys in this context here, but. But I do know that you, you shouldn't uh, you, you shouldn't do war. I mean, war is bad. <laughs> that's, that's well, our great. country has manufactured wars for uh, five decades. Oh yes, oh yes, and that's we are responsible for manufacturing <laughs> these conflicts. I know, I know. And, I, know. I, I have a different view on the United States foreign policy now than I did maybe five or ten years ago. And it's yeah. So we told Russia country. that NATO would not encroach on Russia, and in the last two decades, they. NATO has incorporated every surrounding country around Russia, the exact opposite of what they told Russia. And Russia said, you lied, and we're going to take it back. I mean, duh. So you don't have to support Russia, but you can be like, they're in the right because NATO lied. So mm -hmm. if, if you're a, a warmonger uh, group called NATO, and your force is to get other countries to kill other people, and you say, we're not going to do that, Russia. We're not going to surround you. You're going to be fine. And then we surround you. We are at fault, not Russia, the United States, the United States who's manufactured the Vietnam War, the, the Iraq War, the Afghanistan War, every single war that has nothing to do with us. These people aren't coming to our soil. They're not threatening our sovereignty. We go there and blow them up. That is the problem. And the American right. people don't know that. The leaders are the problem. And I mean, Putin is part of the problem, of course. I mean, if you say... People in the United States, many people in the United States support Russia. I hope they don't support Putin per se, because I mean he's he's not a guy you could you can support. I, I hope because I mean, uh, but but maybe he's been tricked in, in this in this game that they're playing yeah. on the top level. He's been tricked to do this, and and he thinks that this is the only way he can. Well, and and also if you if you think that Putin is evil, which he is, um, you could say the same thing for every other foreign leader if you look into actually what they do the, the obama is like one of the biggest loved presidents of america his first black president blah 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 he murdered more people than almost any other president in the office of the president of the united states but he was given the uh he was giving the nobel peace prize right after he murdered thousands of people and was murdering people with drones at that time was given the Nobel Peace Prize. This is the insanity of the matrix that you talk of. And I'm sure one of the pieces of the puzzle, why you're like, I cannot support this. So let's get back to your colleagues that are still in mainstream media. They're only in there to keep their job, to keep their money, to, to keep their family stable and to keep their future stable. Because if you say anything, remember, you said that your, your superiors came to you and they said, we don't think we like what's going on with your climate change blog. We don't think, we, uh, maybe uh, blah, 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 you're, you're a Holocaust denier. I mean, they're literally pressuring and threatening you to stay on narrative. Isn't that what's going on? 
Yeah, well, in a way, it is like that. But I think most of the people who are working there, they're 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 all on on the same page. They're they're thinking. I mean, it's, I mean, it's pretty obvious. I have still many friends who who work there, and uh, and I see them sometimes, and we, we we have a couple of beers and all that. And it's 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 not that you know. I think many of them, at least the ones that I'm close to, they they can understand what I what I mean when I say these things. But I I don't say. I mean, I never say that I hate that newspaper. I hate those bosses because I don't. I mean, they do what they think is right. I had to get out. You can only take responsibility for your own life and your own decisions. That's what I did. And I can, you can only, I mean, work for a better world if you start with yourself. I can't blame any other people, any other person for doing, for staying there or for doing whatever. I mean, and they, they're convinced that this is not nothing strange. I mean, this is what this newspaper is writing and what Swedish television and radio are broadcasting, that's just normal. They think it's, they, they, they think it's, uh, I mean, it's uh, perf perfectly normal pieces of news that should be out there and they see nothing strange about it. And I can sometimes, I mean, climate change is interesting because I think that quite a few people uh, actually can see or they can sense if they're, they, think for themselves and they look at what's happening with the weather and they have some memory of what happened 20 years ago, 30 years ago, they can kind of sense that, ah, maybe it's a little bit exaggerated, isn't it? Because I mean, it's not that bad and there's not that many people dying from, you know, disasters and so on. So that's, that's actually an interesting uh, entry point. If you want to talk to people about that, everything might not be exactly as it's told in the media, mm -hmm. because that's there. You can, I mean, at least in my environment, I can, I can, I can, since well, when I'm at Greece and talk about climate change, they are like, well, I still think it's a big problem, but yeah, I hear you. And maybe it's not that bad. Hmm, interesting. They say it's interesting and all that. But if you, if you start talking about other and also COVID actually, but COVID is, I mean, practically over now, but that was interesting in Sweden because you might know that Sweden was one of the few countries that didn't have lockdowns and we didn't have, well, for a brief period of time, we had some kind of vaccine mandates mandate but that was only for six weeks or so and then they just scrapped all the restrictions so it was very mild here how many and people I'm, are walking around with masks right now no nobody and oh my god they just increased here so the, the media just really? pushed a few weeks ago that there's a new phase and mask mandates and everyone has masks on i'm in the middle of the most rural area in the united states yeah. 450 miles from a major city this is the most rural you can get in the United States where I'm sitting. I'm eight miles from the New Mexico border, 49 miles from four corners. It's literally in the middle of nowhere. And I, and, but the, but what comes through here are tourists, millions of people every month drive through. It's the only road to take you to California from this area. Is it Southern, Southern Colorado, is it? Yes. The furthest South you can get. And there's one highway that goes East, West through Pagosa Springs where I live. All these people have masks on. They're spraying, cleaning their groceries. It is complete insanity. Yeah, it's insanity. Those people are making themselves sick. They're making themselves mentally ill. They are mentally ill. Yeah. And 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 this is the world. You've been watching it for two years, but yeah. you don't see it in Sweden. Gosh, I wish you lived here. The insanity that is visible here in humanity yeah. is beyond reproach. It's yeah. it's I. I and just like you said, you can't control anyone else but yourself. So mm -hmm. I stoically go in, shop. No, I don't do anything. I never get sick. I haven't been sick for 15 years. I eat clean, whole food that we grow, organic. Um, I don't eat any processed food. I'm not taking in the chemicals from the corporations. I do uh, obviously eat food from the supermarket now and again, but it's a small fraction of my diet, 30%. And, and most people, they're, they're not even eating from the supermarket well. They're eating all the garbage, all the stuff in boxes and bags. That mm -hmm. is processed industrial food that's not even fit for animals in the farmyard, let alone humans. Yeah. I think it's wonderful what you're doing at the, at the farm there. I didn't know until just a few days ago when I read a little bit about you that you, you're doing this all organic and all, and even creating your own energy and everything. It's, it's yeah. Awesome. And it's, it's beyond that. We are living in one of the worst grow zones on the planet. It is, it has a shorter growing season than Anchorage, Alaska here. Oh, it's about 80 days that there's no freezing. Our temperature swing average is 40 to 50 degrees every day of the year. Wow. Yeah. And most plants don't like that. <laughs> but you know, this thing about, you know, growing organically and living and eating only, only, you know, sound food and, and, um, 
natural food and all that. We're, we're 8 billion people on the planet. And, and I think that's, I, I think personally, I think that's not a problem. I think it can be 10 billion or 11 billion. There, there's yeah, 11. enough food for everyone, but, but everyone, everyone can't live in the countryside. Can they? No, that, but, but there's other, see, here's the problem. You're narrowed by what happens in Sweden. My mindset is narrowed by what happens in America. And what we've created is a supply chain. Like, let's just pick Hawaii is the perfect example. No one knows this living on Hawaii. And once they realize what's going on in Hawaii, people move. They leave the island. When they find out 90% of the food is imported to keep this, the island alive, people are like, what? I thought we grew out. We live in a jungle. It's tropical. We've got all this food growing here. That's all being exported. You're only growing pineapples and papayas, and it all gets shipped to third world countries and, and, and Europe. And they realize this, if the supply chain stops coming into Hawaii, the people will start eating themselves within three weeks. They just got the memo. And, and so the modern world is now controlled by the supply chain. The food mm -hmm. that comes into Sweden's supermarkets, the majority of it isn't being produced in Sweden, for goodness yeah. sakes. And the same goes for America. Yeah. But there are countries like China with way more people than us that know how to provide local food. 80% of all the food in China in those prefectures is grown in the prefecture where it's eaten. And I'm talking all the fruits and vegetables are grown. If you go to China in a prefecture, it's 10 houses, then a greenhouse, then a business, then a greenhouse, then a business, then a greenhouse. They are growing all their food locally and they've been doing it for over, for hundreds of years. Yeah. That is how they, that's it, that's yeah, really that is how they feed the population. So we Good need to have also for cities, I guess, uh, a paradigm know. shift. If every major city had thousands of greenhouses surrounding it and all that food was coming into the city, yeah. then if there was a supply chain issue, it wouldn't matter. You'd be like, oh, okay, well, everyone eats vegetables now. We don't get lucky charms, which is not food, <laughs> you know? <laughs> You know, because what we need is whole food grown in the soil locally. When you eat food grown in your local soil, you're getting the nutrients and minerals that are local to your area, which boost your immune system for your local environment. So mm -hmm. by eating the foods and the products locally, your immune system is boosted for any pathogen in that region. So if foreign pathogens come out, you have a super immune system for your region and you just fight it off. If you get sick or a cold, you barely notice it. You're like, oh, I, must, I have a tickle in my throat. I must be sick. As opposed to being infirmed and laid out with the flu for a week, your immune system is boosted. If yeah. you eat boxed processed food, it's literally killing your immune system mm -hmm. because of the chemicals in there. And it, it is making you sicker and sicker. So if, if you've been eating garbage for a decade, your propensity to get ill is very high. And, and those types of people that I know are all sick. Three, you know, I got sick twice in the winter and in spring and blah, blah, blah. And you're just shaking your head. And they're like eating a bag of Doritos for lunch. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I, I hear you. But I, I, I mean, I, I want to eat oranges and, and lemons and bananas, but it's freezing out. I mean, you can't grow that, those things here in Sweden. So Yeah, you can. We have a guy here in America that is growing citrus in minus 40 degrees. Yes. And he's using okay. earth tubes. He's using a 25 watt fan to heat the greenhouse using the geothermal oh. heat of the earth. So the wow. lowest temperature his greenhouses get is 54 degrees, which is the temperature of the earth at depth. So if you just dig down 20 feet, it's 54 degrees everywhere on the planet. Fahrenheit. Yeah. Yeah. And all you, yeah, Fahrenheit. So what is that in centigrade? Uh, would be about uh, 12, maybe. Okay. All right. So that's like the ambient temperature of earth. Yeah. I would say 13 is 12 or 13. Yeah. And so you, we can utilize this. Now, the problem is that if, if we, the, the shift to growing locally using geothermal energy and all this, it, it literally destroys the bottom line of the energy infrastructure and all of these industries. So mm. the multinational corporations have the power to fight against the shift because they don't want you to be energy independent. They don't want you to grow your own food because you're not going to go shop at the store. These are things that they're actively working towards a, to prevent you from doing. Yeah, no, I, I I agree. I mean, I've been I, I think a bit differently now than I did a few years ago. When I I mean, I've always been an optimist, and I've I've loved trade, and I've loved I've called myself a globalization extremist. But I don't mean by that I don't mean I want to point out that I don't mean that that I I love big corporations, but I love uh, borderlessness, if you see what I mean. So I don't like borders. 
I don't like nation states. I want, I have this vision of a world without nation states and without money and without, uh, you know, governments. But I mean, that's a long way away, but you know what I mean? Uh, and I haven't well, had that would be, that's, that's, you're describing that's anarchy. That's yeah. anarchy. No, I think no systems. Actually, I think I'm, I, on some level, I'm an anarchist, I guess. But I don't a lot of people think anarchy means you go beat people in the head with a stick. I don't know. It's it, yeah. It's, it's not like that. Anarchy yeah. means that that you decide no government. Yeah. no government and you make decisions locally. So if you have yeah. a problem with you and your neighbor, you get two other neighbors and you all come together and you say, all right, everyone, let's vote on it. Let's see who's right. Yeah. Because the local community actually knows how to decide what's in their best interest. Some entity 900 miles away from me that's never spoken to me is going to make decisions on how I, what I get get to grow here or yeah. something. Completely insane. So I think a big country like the U.S. Sorry, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I mean, yeah, yeah. So Sweden's a little different. What's the? How long does it take to drive from one end to the other in the well, longest it's distance? Graphically, fairly big, but it's only 10 million people. So it's like, a, I mean, a minor or a, a, an ordinary state in the U.S. I guess. And it's, how long does it take to drive? Five, it's, six hours? No, it takes more. It's, it's pretty oblong, actually. It's like... Um, oh, yeah, the north-south is probably at 11 hours. 600 kilometers, huh? so about... 600 miles. 1,000 miles, 1,000 miles. Okay. Oh, from 1,600 North kilometers, 1,000 miles. Yeah. yeah, so it's like driving from New York to Florida. A little bit like that, yeah. Nor yeah. Northern Florida, <laughs> maybe. Yeah, northern so Florida is 1,000 miles. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So uh, it's fairly big, but uh, people, I guess people tend to think that it's kind of, you know, homogenous in a way, but it's less homogenous now than it used to be, of course, because we've had a lot of Im immigration and people are also in this country and moving to other countries and having vacations in other places and having friends in other parts of the world. So it's, it's all, I mean, it's in, we're integrating. And I think that's a good thing. That's actually one of the tenets of this podcast, Mind the Shift, that I am running, uh, that this world is integrating for the first time uh, in ever, I, I want to say, but at least in a recorded history, uh, because I, I don't think that any of the uh, the known um, powers that have been been uh, running this, this planet have been uh, truly global. I think this is the first time that we know of that Every that all, all of humanity is integrating because we know in real time what is happening, as as you all know, happening on the other side of the planet, uh, because of the commu communication revolution that we've had and um, and the internet. Because of these that. squares, it's because of these square boxes that we are now all cyborgs. Exactly, exactly. We're connected. So yeah. that's that's a big shift, and that does things to us. And I think it's I I think it's mainly positive. It's going to be messy. I always say that. To, or to many of my people that I, to many of my interviewees, uh, I, I say that uh, I think it's going to be messy and they often agree. Uh, so people are going to be, be scared because a lot of things are going to going to go down here on, on this planet in the coming, you know, decades. Things are going to change because we are integrating and because of all kinds of other stuff that's happening. But I think the integration is crucial because that means that we can immediately, like we are doing now, we can immediately exchange ideas. I mean, in no time. And if you have had these thoughts yourself and you thought that you were alone in the world with those, you know now that you're not. Many people are thinking like this. And this is the big change, the big shift. that we're So you're, because you're, when I, I was a little upset when I saw your bio on your uh, website yeah. where it described you as a globalist because I was like, mm -hmm. oh, but you're using this word in a different term than Klaus I Schwab. I am, exactly. I mean, they have hijacked globalization. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So their idea of globalism is complete control of humanity, where, yeah. where when you and I are like saying we like the, the exchange of ideas yeah. to have yeah. like in science, can you imagine the benefit of a global scientific community? Uh, but, and and you, you're interested in the Younger Dryas event. You've recently interviewed some scientists that specialize in it. Yeah, and yeah. and and the Younger Dryas event. Only recently did we get information from Russian scientists to corroborate the Black Mad idea. And now yeah. we we now know because there's some exchange of ideas. 
only recently after the Cold War that this phenomenon of burning on the Northern Hemisphere was global. And, and we didn't know that until the Russian scientists said, oh, we've got tons of papers. We found that here too. And then you're like, wow. But yeah. in a global society, when every country is connected by science, the mm -hmm. breakthroughs will be exponential. The, yeah. the, the information gain will be positive. But yeah. people like Klaus Schwab, they don't want that. They want to control every country's science and have it all to themselves so that they can then tell you what the real science is. Yeah, but I think it's not going to be viable for, for very long, actually, that approach. <laughs> well, no, because you would have a global civil war where the yeah. population would rise up and find the people responsible for this. That would be a very – but maybe that's what they want. Mm -hmm. I mean, do you, you know of the uh, Georgia Guidestones that recently got blown up? The what? The, the Georgia, Georgia Guidestones? No, uh, no, I don't think I've heard about that, no. These were megaliths that were erected in Georgia decades ago that was calling for a one world global society with just 500 million people and on and on where if you read it, you come to the conclusion like, oh my God, they want to kill 7.5 billion people. Yeah. Who is they? Who is the person that erected this? Yeah. And, and it, it got blown up uh, this year. Someone blew it up at, in the yeah. middle of the night. So you can go check that out. But it is literally the playbook of Klaus Schwab. And um, it also then connects a little bit to the Bible, like Armageddon and the, and the end of the earth and 500 million left or whatever the Bible says. I'm not a, a, a Bible bumper or whatever they call those people. But so here we are. We're at a time where we're cyborgs, right? We're globally connected by these squares. And we've got a nefarious group of globalists, not like you and I, that want total control of humanity. How do we fight back? Now, you've become independent, so you can do your own journalism, and I've done the same. And I'm living by example of what humans can do. We live in the most harsh growing environment. And if, if Leah and I can come out here and build an infrastructure that we can feed ourselves and be self-sufficient in the most difficult area to do that, then anyone can do it anywhere on the world. Mm. And that's what we need to do. We need to inspire a shift from within. The only person you can change is yourself. And yeah. once you change yourself, the people around you change with you. Either that exactly. or they go away. Exactly. Because, because if, you're, if you're living a purpose-driven life where you wake up with a purpose to move forward or to, to do something new and better, the only people you're going to attract are people that want to join you in that journey. Mm -hmm. and, and, and so you're going to gain people to support your, what you're doing and, and lose people that don't support what you're doing. Yeah. So I think it's an imperative that we teach people how to become completely independent from the system because as this shift occurs, we, we already see what's happening. It's, there's going to be recession. There's going to be collapse. There's going to be famine. And because of the climate, not because of anthropogenic global warming, because of natural climate variability, we've been in a very quiet time for thousands of years with just small fluctuations. You talked about the Roman warm, then we had the dark ages, then it warmed up again. And then we had the Maunder minimum and everyone froze and then it warmed up again and now we're warm again. It's been warm for 200 years. Guess what happens after 200 years of warm every time? It gets cold and we are entering the next cold period which I don't know if you've ever heard of is called grand solar minimum. Yeah. The sun has been shutting down for two decades. Mm -hmm. yeah. The cycle we're currently in is the weakest in the last 100 years. The last cycle was the weakest in 100 years, cycle 24. And there are many scientists and physicists that are predicting that by 2035, it may be the coldest since uh, the Dalton minimum. And during the Dalton minimum, we had famines, we had the year without a summer. So all you need in a minimum is a big volcanic eruption and the entire planet is screwed because mm -hmm. the temperature drops a few degrees. Even a one degree C drop in temperature will destroy the crops. Mm -hmm. And it's happened in the past. We have historical documentation of it. We have historical documentation of the food riots in London, um, mass die-offs. Up to 40% of the population in Europe died in the early 1800s from cold and famine. Yeah. This is not taught to the children in school. Yeah, but Did we learned that in school. That's true, but that was a different world. I mean, we didn't have uh, 
communication. People were so dirt poor everywhere and there was not, I mean. Yeah, but we didn't have supply chains. If that no. happens today and the supply chain ends, people will die even more rapidly. Rather if the supply chain ends, then I think. Because I, I, Anders, I think, yeah. in 1800, the population of earth was it's growing really their weird. own food. We were agrarian. As early as 1910 in America, 90% of food was produced in your backyard. Today, less than 2% of the population grows their own food. Yeah. So we are stuck like Chuck. The moment there's no food in the supermarket, people die because they're stupid. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll, yeah. See about <laughs> we'll see about that. Well, I mean, people like you and I are, are very resourceful. We're going to be yeah. fine. But the general person that gets their food from the supermarket, the day the supermarket closes forever, they're going to stare into this square and cry because they're going to have no, no signal. More, more, I mean, they take care of each other more than people think. That's also a narrative that we've been told that, that people are selfish and stupid, as you say. I think that's not true. I think that's just because, uh, I mean, that's, it it's, fits well with the powers that be. It's, it's perfect for them to have a population that is, Number one, scared of something like climate change or whatever, or, or, or the Russians or so. And, and number two, they think that everybody else is selfish so that we need we need a power structure because otherwise that would be chaos. There's chaos without leaders. And that's that's just a false narrative that we've been told. And there's a brilliant book by a Dutch historian called Rutger Bregman. I don't know if you've heard of him. It's called Humankind. It's a brilliant book, and it's it debunks all these myths about people's selfishness. And, well, no, and you just all you have to do is come to my town. We have yeah. two thousand people. There's almost no police. There is no crime. The only murders that have ever been recorded here are is when a family member shoots another family member in an argument. Mm -hmm. it, it's not mm -hmm. like people are getting jacked for their cars. There is no crime here, and the reason is is because of what you just said, people are kind. Yeah. <laughs> if, if there aren't any problems, even if you're dirt poor, if you're walking down the street in Pagosa and you have nothing and you just turn and say, I'm starving, people, they'll give you the shirt off their back and all the they food. And and it's, it's actually the same in cities. People think that cities are so crass and, and, and harsh and, and everybody is just evil, but it's not true because there are neighborhoods in cities as well. And I mean, where, where I live, just outside of Stockholm cities, Stockholm city center. I mean, in this house, people know each other and we help each other. If something happens, if, if some old lady needs to have her groceries uh, brought home, we can help her with that. So, I mean, th there are little communities everywhere, even in big cities. Yeah. But there is also nefarious elements in especially American cities. They're becoming extremely dangerous. You, you don't have the right to walk down the road anymore without being murdered. Let's say where I grew up in Philadelphia, it is what, the, the murder rate has increased tenfold in just a few years. Yeah, I know. And, and this is by design. Even, even worse, I mean, since yeah. 2016, yeah. So, and, the, and the leaders in the city are like, no, everything's fine. They, yeah. they literally believe everything is fine in their city when people are being murdered at exceptional rates. What is that? What is that? Yeah. I mean, what is that? No, that's true. We have this problem in Sweden with uh, gang violence. I don't know if it's gangs or... You call them gangs. Uh, it's, yeah. uh, young young men who are competing for for the um, the narcotics market in the turf. In, yeah, the turf <laughs> in, in suburbs of Stockholm and Gothenburg and, and uh, to some extent Malmo, and they have began shooting each other at a, at, a, at an unprecedented rate, rate since about four or five years ago. And it's very strange because this is not happening in other Western European countries, and nobody know it's nobody has a clue. But this is actually big. A big issue. It was the biggest, one of the biggest issues in the the election that we had. Uh, so, is it, it what's the drug? Is it fentanyl or meth? What's the no? Big it's drug? actually, I think it's marijuana or cocaine. Is more traditional drugs. Huh. So, wow. But wow. Uh, and and but I, I, the general murder rate in Sweden hasn't gone up. It's it's stable. But this means that I, I guess half of all the murders that take place are between these turf uh, leaders, gang leaders, uh, gang people, and. And uh, and the rest of the murder, the, the other part of the murder rate has gone down steeply, but that, that doesn't show because of these killings. And it's it is a big problem, of course, but it doesn't affect everybody. I mean, I, I never think about it if I don't read the papers, but I don't I don't know what I want to say with this, but it's uh, 
this is actually a, a problem. It, it is a, a problem because it's violent and, and uh, young people get killed and it's terrible. And it is a big issue in, in politics here in Sweden. So, and as so I said, world, because in Germany, ne the Netherlands, Belgium, France, England, they don't have the, these shootings. They don't have these shootings. It's very strange. And they have the same amount of, uh, you know, poor people, poor immigrant people from the Middle East, which are often uh, people who are taking part, of, part in these violent acts. They have the same amounts, the same proportions of those kinds of people there, but they don't have these shootings. So what happened here? Nobody knows. It's very strange. Well, we got a world falling apart yeah. while we are all rising up in a global society and information is being shared faster than ever before. And there are lots of people waking up that a lot of the mainstream media narrative are lies. And, and how do you think this unravels? If, if more and more people wake up, they're clearly the easiest thing to do is just to turn off mainstream media and go look for alternative sources like you and I. And a lot of people just watch me for their news because what I do is I'll do a weather forecast, but I'll also put in some two or three topical subjects each day that I think is the most important issue, let's say, whether it be scientific or social. And, and so that, and, and literally I only say like the most important thing that happened during the day where the news is a constantly scaring you to death, right? Ah, climate, look, fear, fear, fear. Yeah. I'm like, well, yeah, this is extreme weather, but if you had a generator, you'd be fine. So I'm giving you the more practical end. Yeah. Like the, the power has been going out forever. It's not a new thing. <laughs> People think like power outages are new and hurricanes are new. Oh my God, a hurricane hit Florida. I'm like, yeah, they've been hitting <laughs> Florida forever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But the mainstream was, media is good at convincing you that you don't know what you know. Yeah, but they, I mean, they're just mimicking and... Uh, parroting what 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 leaders are say are telling them and uh, i mean leading scientists not leading scientists but but uh, the scientists that have the ear of the media yeah are telling them and an extreme example is of course uh, the un boss antonio guterres you heard him talk about yeah. these things of course and he says and he's backed up by wmo the world meteorological organization which is a, a un or organ since a few years back and they are writing the most, I mean, horrible. <laughs> I, I, I actually am reluctant to use the word lies, but it's actually so bad. It's so far from truth that it's actually, uh, it is actually a lie, what they're writing about extreme weather. And then he says, he, he holds a speech, Antonio Guterres, where he says that there's cold red for humanity and storms and hurricanes and wildfires and droughts are increasing like never before it's a terrible situation and it's it's completely the other way i mean it's it's not it's it is not true full stop period i mean and of course the journalists are hearing the united nations boss say these things and they of course they think he he knows what he's talking about because he's the un boss so, yeah i mean well you can you can make it anything true depending on where you start your data and so the way that the WEF and the UN do it is they go back, let's say, for wildfires. The lowest point in wildfires in history was in 1978. So they picked that as a starting point because anything that starts at the lowest point will rise from there. Yeah. And they start in 79 and say, look at it, wildfires are rising. If you go back to 1930, you're going to find that there were 700% more wildfires than today. And they don't tell you that. They just yeah. show you from 1979. They say, oh, it's over. We're all going to die. The oh, same yeah. thing goes for this sea level rise narrative. Yeah. If, if sea level was going to rise the way that they're claiming, then the insurance industry would not insure any homes on the beach. Yet they continue to build the most extravagant million-dollar mansions beachfront. If the sea level was going to catastrophically rise, these adjusters would know it and they would never – ensure the, the buildings yet they do so in plain sight is the truth but when you're watching that narrative on the the boob tube you're hearing the brainwashing goes in you're like oh my god the sea level is going to rise we're all going to die and people that actually live on the beach that i know are like yeah i've seen the sea level rise and i'll get them buoy data that in daytona beach to show them that there's been three millimeters rise since 1880 yeah, yeah. like oh that's that i didn't see that I'd be like you're looking at erosion do you know that beaches need to be replenished with sand? And if exactly. the sand gets removed, it'll look like the sea level came up. 
Yeah. They don't get it. They don't. They just it's the don't. same here in southern Sweden. There is erosion yeah. on the beaches, and people think it's sea, sea, sea level rising. It, it isn't. It isn't. <laughs> because I mean, this country is actually still rising after the the, the ice age. So it's uh, yeah, and that's called isostasy, which is another yeah. word people need to look up. Mm -hmm. Right, so you, should, you, should, you know about Roger Pilke Jr. in in Colorado at, at, at Boulder, Colorado University of Colorado Boulder. What's his name? Roger Pilke Jr. Yes. Yeah. Otherwise, you should check him out. I mean, Did you interview about him? extreme weather events. He's 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 the I think he's the prime expert on that subject actually. Oh, cool. And he, he, know, he knows all about <clears throat> what we are talking about right now. And I often refer to him, and I've interviewed him several times. Also, awesome. All right. So here's uh, Anders' uh, YouTube is Mind the Shift. We're going to link it below. We want you all to go over there and subscribe. He's got some amazing interviews recently. Four weeks ago, you did uh, Brian Forster. And I'm just pointing out like um, some of the people that uh, our viewers would really be interested. Brian Forster, uh, two months ago, you did Robert Schock. Um, who, who else do we have on here? Well, there's a lot of esoteric things because I'm I'm into that as well. I don't know if you're Egyptians. Yeah. Yeah. What do you think about the whole e Egyptian narrative? Egyptian narrative? Yeah, the one where they claim that Egypt was built four thousand years ago. The pyramid. No, I, no <laughs> I mean going back to the Younger Dryas event. Uh, I'm I'm all for this these theories that that humanity has actually collapsed and risen several times. There have been waves of civilization. Uh, I mean, it makes more sense when you think about it, <clears throat> because if you if you use Occam's razor, which is, I mean, the most simple explanation is often the, the correct one. Uh, it's actually very cumbersome and strange to think that everything just happened like that 6,000 years ago, 4,000 BC, that all the civilizations just rose out of nothing from Stone Age. Like yeah, we, were, all of a sudden we woke up, we were farming, we were writing. We did everything uh, at once and in, on different continents simultaneously. Simultaneously. It's, it's actually a strange theory, but that's, I mean, since that is the mainstream narrative, narrative, people think that that's the most simple explanation, but it isn't. It's a very complicated explanation because then you have to explain why there are, why you find all these advanced megalithic structures in Egypt and in, in Jordan, in Lebanon, in Peru, in Bolivia, in many places, which couldn't have been done by the civilizations that were there 6,000 years ago or, or even, even more recently, because uh, they didn't use hardened steel. They didn't use machines. They didn't have electricity. We know that. And yet they still say that, well, they must have done it because they nobody it. else was there. They built the pyramid with flip flops and wheelbarrows. Flip flops and wheelbarrows. They didn't even have wheelbarrows because they didn't have the wheel. They didn't have the wheel. The wheel no. is supposedly invented 3,600 years ago. The no. dumbest thing I've ever. You can Google it. It'll literally say 1600 BC, the wheel was invented. I'm like, that's the, the same time the Antikythera mechanism was found. The, or, or dropped in the bottom of the ocean. So we oh, have yeah. a, a yeah, computer that's... at the same time that they yeah. invented the wheel. Mm -hmm. I mean, these historians are completely insane. Yeah. And we also, this is something else that's interesting, that there's waves of, uh, of technology. There was orthodontics and mm -hmm. dentistry 3,000 years ago, but we forgot how to do it, and yeah. we only relearned it 700 years ago. Mm. It's like, what? How does that happen? How are they doing dentistry in ancient Egypt, but for 3,000 years we forgot it and only yeah. reinvented it? Yeah. It's like our the history is so wrong. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it is wrong. It is wrong. And so that's that's one of my topics. I, two other guys that your audience might be interested in is uh, that I talked to is Michael Tellinger. He's a bit... Oh, yeah. <laughs> He's a bit controversial, but he says many, many interesting things. Uh, the South. African I disagree country. with the the majority of what Tellinger says. Yeah. He's gone a little woo woo. But um, a little woo woo. Then but I do believe that those circles and the stone structures and yeah. all over Africa are from a previous time. Yeah. And then we have Andrew Collins as well. Oh, nice. Yeah, he knows a lot about Gubekli Tepe. You know this Turkish. Uh, this site in southern Turkey that actually upends much of the mainstream narrative, but but they haven't really uh, admitted that yet. Right, and they just found a an older site nearby called yeah. Karan Tepe. Yeah. Karan Tepe dates to before the Younger Dryas event, or just about twelve thousand five, maybe thirteen thousand. Yeah. And some scientists went over there just this month 
to camp there uh, during the winter solstice. And as the sun rose, it shot through Karang Tepe into a cave that they've excavated and illuminated a face on the back wall. Oh, wow. these, these types of archaeoastronomy have been repeated by uh, in Chaco Canyon, by the Anasazi here in southwestern Colorado, and all over the world. We have yeah. archaeoastronomy now dating back 13,000 years all over the planet. And That's I don't know if you've ever read the book, uh, Hamlet's Mill by Von Deschen. I know about it. Yeah, but no, I haven't. It's, it's <laughs> thick and it takes a week or more to get through. Yeah. But what they uncovered is the that the great year, the procession of the equinoxes, 12,560 mm. years is encoded in the um, in all of the megalithic structures, encoded in the geometry, the sacred geometry, yeah. whether it be the length, the width, but the mathematics that are included in all megalithic structures all over the world yeah. have the procession of the equinoxes within it. Uh -huh. It's complete yeah. insanity. So yeah, what we have, if in fact we have civilization resetting, the previous civilization was much more advanced than ours. They knew about a clock cycle and these catastrophes that regularly occur. And they built these megalithic structures to survive the catastrophes so that we would find them and we would be like, oh my God, there were people here. Yeah. Yet that yeah. We haven't done that. No. The archaeologists are like, oh, it all started uh, when we found <laughs> these buildings again. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> I know. It's fascinating. Uh, speaking about uh, civilizations that, that, that uh, collapsed during the, the Younger Dry, uh, have you, uh, do you know about um, Uncharted X and uh, Bright Insight, two channels on YouTube? Uh, I liked a little bit of Jimmy's work until he said that Atlantis was the recat structure was Atlantis. Then yeah. I, then he's a complete joke at that point. And Uncharted X as well, they do some good work, but they also are, have their own twist, which mm. is they cherry pick. So they've come up with this Phoenix idea. I think that's yeah. them. Is that them with the Phoenix I, event? I can't remember. I can't remember if, the, if it's them. No. Well, I like Uncharted X because they're actually going out in the field with Randall Carlson and looking at the geology. You can't yeah. be a scientist, like a geologist like myself, by reading a book, you have to go out there and look at the rocks and see mm -hmm. what you're talking about in order to come up with ideas or hypotheses. It doesn't happen sitting in, well, it can happen in a boardroom. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. But to do science, you have to do it. Mm -hmm. You're not going to get it from reading literature. But what he's saying about, uh, what Jimmy is saying about the recut structure is, I mean, I can, I can understand what you're saying there. I, I agree that it's a bit far-fetched to think that that's the uh the capital the recat structure is an a million a tens of millions of years old geologic feature where there mm -hmm. was an uplift dome that eroded sedimentary rocks creating yeah. concentric rings it's an mm -hmm. erosional feature that is tens of millions of years old not mm -hmm. a city and, and to claim somehow that it's man-made is completely ludicrous because it's a natural feature it's like saying a zit on your face is atlantis because that's what this feature is. It is a boil on earth that rose up, was eroded flat, was covered by new sedimentary layers that yeah. then got eroded during a major catastrophe in the Younger Dryas. There's evidence that a mega tsunami washed over the yeah. entire yeah. continent yeah. of Africa. Yeah. I can show you the features and mm -hmm. it only, it, it revealed the recat structure mm -hmm. 12,000 years ago. So mm -hmm. this, Tens of millions of years old feature was recently revealed due to an erosional event. Yeah. It has nothing to do with men making a city. No. It's completely insane. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Good. I mean, you and, know more, and, more about that than I do, but I just think it's fascinating to listen to all these theories. I am a, one of the top experts on Younger Dryas. I've read every paper. I talk about it every week. I research it every week. I've been looking into it for seven years and a lot of people give it a cursory view and claim to be an expert, uh, like Jimmy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so, so let me have you on my shift. Just yes, because you have a million views doesn't mean you're a scientist or you're no, smart. No. That's true. <laughs> so let me have you on my shift then, Diamond. I would love to come on Mind the Shift. And I implore everyone to go Thank check you. out Mind the Shift on YouTube. Uh, some of the greatest people you've interviewed you are tenacious and maybe i just need to move to sweden and wear a suit jacket 
<laughs> and I'll get more. Well, I guess there's some, there's a little bit, little for everyone there on the on on, on my chef. There's you and I are, yeah, are so different, Anders. People like you because you're nice. I'm not <laughs> nice, so I have a problem. I don't have the nice like the blocker. If the the moment you say something that I disagree with, I'm going to tell you why. Yeah, yeah, well, that's good. Maybe we complement each other very yeah, well then. So a lot of people are scared to come on my show, but the people that do come on my show watch it. They love what I do and they know I'm not going to attack them. So some of the top scientists that are climate deniers are happy to come on the show. Yeah. And, uh, and even some of the not so climate denier type scientists like to come on the show because I support the work they do. Like mm -hmm. people that are you know, the whole narrative of the great barrier reef being bleached and dying. Complete mm. fallacy. Yeah, yeah. One of the yeah. top scientists in the field, Jennifer Morohassi, the only one that scuba dives on the reef to do the actual science to go look at it, mm. says that they're all liars. And she's mm. been blackballed, and, and we love to have her on the show. She would be a great interview for Mind the Shift, I believe. Have you talked to her? No, no, I haven't. I would love to hook you up with her info. Yeah, yeah. All right, um, so Anders Bowling has his uh, YouTube channel, Mind the shift at mind the shift. You're also um, on all audio podcast platforms, correct? Yeah. You're on Apple. You're on Spotify. Spotify Google, they whatever they're called. I, I don't know. It's uh, yeah. It's out there. I publish all my, my, my podcasts on, on audio and, uh, but I mean the base, the, the main channel is on YouTube, of course. And that's where I do most of the, the work with with them. I mean, you can get some extra material if you watch it. Watch the episode on YouTube, which you don't get on on the audio platforms. So, um, yeah. What's the best way that the people listening can come support you? Is it to watch your YouTube? Do you have a Patreon? A way they can donate no, to you? Don't have a Patreon. Well, I I think I have an account, but I've never done anything with it because I I, th I didn't really understand what I was supposed to do there. But um, well, I, I they can they can support me via PayPal if, if they want to. Uh, so there's a PayPal account. Uh, it's a do and where would they find that? PayPal.me slash Anders Bowling. PayPal.me, M-E slash Anders Bowling. Is that on your uh, AndersBowling.com website? I think it's somewhere there, yeah. I think it is, yeah. All right, well, we're going to supply you with all the links for Anders' podcast, his website, and his YouTube below. So go subscribe there and listen um, I haven't listened. I just found you the other week. So I haven't had time to listen to all those. I only listened to the Robert shock interview. Mm. Um, and I found it fascinating because, um, Robert shock is so busy that he is not up on the latest research on the younger Dryas. So when yeah. he's speaking, I'm like, Oh, cause he didn't read the recent paper. Um, and I'd love to get to him to fill him in on what he's missing because yeah. I love his idea of the solar outburst. Yeah. During the Younger Dryas, but there are other things going on. In fact, yeah. the Younger Dryas catastrophe that reset society began 16,500 years ago when the first pulse of sea level rose. And this is during the bowling Alarod warming. And then there was another event at 12.9, which dropped the temperature. And then there was another event at 11.5, which took us out of it. So there are three events, not one, not one solar outburst. There are multiple things going on. Yeah. And I think that if all of the top people in the field come together and we have some a sort of a mind meld, um, that we are going to get places. And yeah. so what's happening now is there's bickering. Like for the last decade, people are calling out Graham Hancock and being like, it's not a comet. And he, all he talks about is a comet. Mm -hmm. And then Robert Shock's like, it's the sun. And, you know, <laughs> what if it's the sun and a comet and asteroids and everything happening yeah, over yeah. a 5,000 year period? Yeah. And that, just like you say, we use Occam's razor on the show. The most logical is that there are multiple things happening because this event takes thousands of years to unfurl. Mm. You know, yes. a lot of people think that all the mammoths were frozen on one day with mm -hmm. buttercups in their mouth. Mm -hmm. Well, the, the science doesn't support that. There are mammoths that are found frozen 41,000 years ago. There are 25,000 year old mammoths. There are 12,000 year old mammoths. And so there is something else going on. There are multiple events about 15,000 years ago that reset earth. And when I mean reset, 
I mean, it killed 65% of the megafauna. It just, it probably killed 80% of the population or more. And it, and it sent us into a dark age for 6,000, 7,000 years until we started farming and building cities again, which yeah. was about 5,000 years ago. Yeah. 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 So I, I, I believe you. I think everybody has their pet uh, pet theory, you know, uh, about these things. So well, it, it, you don't need a theory if you can take all of the data and put it out on a table and look at it. I know. So if you yeah. take all the papers and throw it out there, you don't have to throw them away and create your own idea. <laughs> no, but no. You, you do have to do it if you write a book and you want to make money. You have to stick with your theory. That's the problem. Yeah. So you've got these old school scientists that are like astrophysics is dead for the last 10 years. Almost every article coming out on a new discovery in space is scientists are baffled. It's like, yeah, your model has been wrong for a hundred years. You need a new model of cosmology. Yeah. We are not, there is no big bang that that doesn't hold water. We look out to the end of the universe and it's older than the end of the universe. Like we just got this satellite that looked out there. Let's look at the edge of the universe. We looked out there and we're like, wait a minute. <laughs> That's not the edge of the universe. <laughs> so there are huge problems in science and, and, and huge problems in people. People have egos that can get hurt or they have egos that have been built up for their whole life and, and their whole life is based on a false idea. How do you just throw that out and say, okay, I'll, get, I'll, I'll think of a new way. <laughs> it's hard to do that. Yeah, yeah, I know, yeah. All right, so give me some final words and inspiration for the people out there. What what should we all be doing to help each other? Well, be the change up. you want to see in the world. I mean, it's an old cliche, but it's I think it's true. Be the change. Do start with yourself if you want to see change in the world, and if you feel that something is off in in the mainstream media, in politics, in the educational system, wherever. Uh, and then, as you said, Diamond, when you start doing things differently, people will see that you are doing the right thing and they will realize that they, oh, these guy, this guy really, really is onto something and he or she knows what they're doing and they will follow. And so that's how we change the world, I think. Start with yourself and then inspire others. Yes, be the change you want to see. Yeah. All right, Anders, it's been a pleasure talking to you. I hope everyone goes out and subscribes, watches all his awesome interviews, and we'll have you on the show soon. Or I'll come over there at Mind the Shift and we'll talk about, we could talk about mag the magnetic excursion that we're in. So we, yeah. we are potentially going into a magnetic reversal, but right now the North Pole is rapidly moving. You're aware of that? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so we can talk about, about yeah, for all these geological things that you're an expert on. I mean, I'm fascinated. I would love to have you. Write show. a list of questions. So I do Q and A's where people have all these burning geologic questions that they want to know. And then I, because I was a teacher, I can explain it in layman's terms very simply. And they're like, wow, I finally got that. Yeah. 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 So it'll be fun. Let's do it. All right. Pleasure talking to you. Go check out Anders Bowling, mind the shift, and we'll see you soon. Thank you for having me. Yes. We love you.